I'm going to start recording. So um, before I get into the content, thank you all for submitting your lab preferences and group preferences. I believe everyone got exactly what they um, requested. So if you go to the homepage of the Canvas website now, there's a table here that includes all the uh, group information. So names of each group, your lab section, um, the name of your group's personal lab PC. So this is the name that you'll use to remote desktop into the lab PC. And then each of the FPGA boards themselves, you'll SSH from the lab PC into the FPGA board. Uh, I'm gonna demo all this, but that's password protected. So the default password that I set up for all these boards is uh, given here. Once you log into your board, I'd encourage you to change this password to something that you and your group agree to. Um, and like I think I mentioned last time, your, the labs will start on Monday. So if you're in the Monday lab section, I'll see you on, on Monday um, via Zoom for the lab section. Even if you're not enrolled in the Monday section, uh, you are welcome to come. You're welcome to come to any of the lab sections. We're not, um, we have enough hardware that we don't have to share among groups. So if you're enrolled in Friday and you'd like to attend on Wednesday, you are more than welcome to. Um, it's just, we will, we will do our lab checkouts on the day for which you were enrolled. So if you're enrolled on a Monday, we'll check you out on a Monday and a Wednesday on a Wednesday and a Friday on a Friday. Okay. Any questions about this stuff? Okay. I forgot to mention last time too, it, it appears like I'm talking to you from like a jail cell or maybe a psych ward. Um, I'm not, I'm in Phillips 208, just so you can sort of place me in physical reality. It doesn't seem like I'm talking from some alternate dimension. So I'm right next door to Joe's office down the hall from Bruce's office. Um, if I'm on campus, I'm either in here or I'm messing with the FPGAs in 238. So if any of your classes are on campus and you walk by 238 and I'm in there, just knock and I'll wave at you and you can wave back at me. Okay. Um, so what I wanted to do today is do just some basic Verilog review. And um, I'm only doing one day of this because I think for most of you, this, you've seen a lot of this material before, so I don't want to waste your time. But I do feel like it's a good idea to maybe reconnect some neurons that might have atrophied since you've seen this material last and to get folks on the same page. So um, I'm going to do this by keeping my screen shared. For some reason for me, it's very difficult to handwrite code. I feel like handwriting exercise is one part of my brain and code writing is a different part and it's very difficult for me to write by hand code. So I'm going to try to do it this way um, using a, a listing in a Jupyter notebook that will do syntax highlighting according to the Verilog um, syntax conventions. If you hate this, just let me know. But I figure we'll give this a shot and see how this goes. Um, before I get into to talking about sort of Verilog code itself, I wanted to go over a few sort of high level, I want to remind everyone of some high level concepts to keep in the back of your mind as you start working on lab one. Um, the first thing that I want to remind everyone is we're writing in this course synthesizable Verilog, which means we're writing Verilog that's going to get burned onto the FPGA. The thing to keep in mind is the only hardware that will live that goes on the FPGA is the hardware that you describe in your Verilog. There's no, there's no, nothing else that lives on there. So that has a few sort of implications that I want to remind everyone of. Um, the first implication to remind folks of is there are no init statements in Verilog. Um, if you initialize a register in Verilog, you, when the board resets, you cannot expect that the register that you've initialized in code will receive the value that you want for it to receive. Um, what you have to do instead is build your own state machine that has a specific reset state. And in that reset state, that's where you initialize all of your register values. 
Um, so you instead need a state machine with a reset state. The only, the only exception to this, which I hesitate to even tell you because I worry that it'll introduce more problems than, than solve problems is if you're developing in the Cordis environment that we'll be using for programming the FPGA and you initialize a register value, the first time the Cordis burns that Verilog onto the FPGA, the register will be initialized as you specified. But when the board resets, you don't get the value back, right? So it is good practice to build a state machine with a reset state and initialize all of your um, register values in there. The other thing to keep in mind is um, there are no system calls in Verilog because there's no system, right? The only hardware on this board is the hardware that you've added. So we can't do things like, like call a print routine because there's no printer. Um, the only memory that's on these boards is memory that you build yourself. So this has certain implications when it comes time to debug Verilog that you've put onto the FPGA. Um, you can't deploy the sorts of debugging techniques that you might deploy in like C development or something where you put print statements in and sort of parse out what's going on and what's going wrong. Um, you're going to use other techniques. And the primary technique is to simulate everything thoroughly in the simulation environment that I'll, I'll talk about today if we have time. And then um, once the Verilog is on the board, there are a few debugging sort of methods that you can use. The most simple being there's a whole set of LEDs and hex displays on the board. So you can use those for debugging. Um, and then what you can also do is um, there is an on-chip logic analyzer built into Cordis that you can put on the FPGA along with your design, which allows you to see the actual values that your registers are assuming as your, your Verilog is running. And as a part of lab one, I think it's a part of the week two checkout, you'll just have to demonstrate a basic understanding of how this logic analyzer works. Because um, I think that you'll find for a lot of the subsequent labs, it's a really nice debugging tool for once you've gone from the simulation environment to the actual FPGA. Um, the third concept that I'll remind everyone of is there are no reels or floats in Verilog. There's really, the only real data type that you have is a register, which is, a, which is just a collection of bits, right? So you can make that register various sizes. You could have a one bit register, which only contains one bit. You could have a 32 bit register. You can make it very large if you wanted. Um, but all that you have are collections of bits. Now, if you wanna call that collection of bits an int, you may do so but it's up to you then to write the routines that treat that collection of bits as an int. So you would have to write, you know, um, or a fixed point's a better example. If you wanna treat that collection of bits as a fixed point, you have to write the fixed point multiplier that manipulates them as, you, as a fixed point. Um, same one uh, FPGA manipulated. I still don't know. Okay. Or a float, right? You could write a floating point multiplier and treat these things as floats, but at the end of the day, it's just collections of bits that you have to manipulate. Um, the next thing I'll remind folks of is there is no timing information in Verilog, which is to say there's not a concept of like a delay function call. Um, you can't say something like delay for 20 milliseconds because there's no hardware on there that's counting off 20 milliseconds. What you have, um, you do have a hardware clock. So you have some hardware clock that's ticking away at some rate. There's a 50 megahertz clock on the board and, and um, you can, you can build phase lock loops to, to, to add clocks to the board as well. So 
in lab two or in lab three, you might be inclined to put a, a 100 megahertz hardware clock on the FPGA to speed things up a bit, maybe to add more nodes to your drum or to draw your Mandelbrot set faster. Um, but this is just to say that if you want to do something like delay for 10 milliseconds, the way that you do that in Verilog is you figure out how many hardware, how many ticks of that hardware clock are in 10 milliseconds and you count off that number of ticks. So you do your own timing based off of a hardware clock. I'll remind folks that um, loops in Verilog are not sequential structures. The repeated hardware. So if you have something like a for loop, right? If you loop through a for loop 50 times and within that loop, you have some logic that, you know, builds hardware. When, when that gets compiled, what that's going to do is build 50 copies of the hardware in that for loop and then execute them all in parallel which is maybe what you want, right? I'm just saying, I, you know, this is not to say don't use loops. It's just to remind you that a loop in Verilog is different from a loop in something like C. It's a different tool. Um, so use it wisely. And, uh, um, but they can be very useful. In lab two, for example, when we're building the drum, the logic associated with each of the nodes is quite similar. So, we can use a, a generate statement, which is essentially a loop to build a whole bunch of copies of essentially the same hardware and make our Verilog a whole lot more readable. But just keep in mind, if you are using a loop, think, think about it and be very conscious about what you're doing because you're not building something sequential. You're, build, you're building lots of copies of a piece of hardware. Just make certain that that's what you want to do. Um, I'll remind folks that modules in Verilog, um, modules are pieces of reusable hardware. A module looks a lot like a function um, in that it has inputs, it performs operations on those inputs, and then it returns an output. So it looks a lot like a function. Um, but every time you instantiate a module, the compiler will build the hardware in that module again and place another copy on the FPGA, right? Which again is maybe what you want to do, but just keep in mind that that is what you're doing. So if you do something like build a loop and instantiate a module within that loop, so you loop through some loop a hundred times and you're instantiating a module in there, you're going to build a hundred copies of that module and put them all on the FPGA. Um, which again, is maybe what you want to do, but maybe not. So just be careful. Um, if anybody has any questions, just interrupt me. I'm just going to sort of keep driving ahead, but you can interrupt me at any time. I'll remind folks that each assign and always statement happens all the time. If it can be happening, it is happening. So if you have a bunch of assigned statements, they're all executing in parallel with one another. Um, there is no concept of sequentiality in Verilog unless you build that sequentiality with a state machine which is what, what a lot of the labs are gonna be about is building these state machines that step through some process. Um, but you're responsible for building sequential execution in Verilog. If you don't, every assign and every always is gonna be happening all the time and in parallel with one another. If you do want to, you, you can tie, I'm gonna go through some code to show this, but if you do want an aspect of timing associated with these, you can tie an always or an assign to the positive edge or the, or the negative edge of a clock, right? So you can have this happen at every pause edge or neg edge of a clock cycle. 
Um, but if it can be happening, it, it will be happening. Um, in fact, I'm just going to make that a. There is no sequentiality except for that which you build in a state machine. Um, and then the last thing I'll mention, and I'm going to expand upon this in a moment, is be very careful about incomplete case statements and incomplete if else statements. So an incomplete case or if can infer a latch. Maybe an inferred latch is something that's familiar to all of you, but I'm, I think it's worth me taking a few minutes to remind folks of what that's all about. Um, so that's what the next section of this is going to be. I, I want to show you some code and review this. Um, but recall that, you know, in Verilog, we're dealing with hardware. So we're assigning values to, um, to a wire, essentially, and it has to have a value. So if your case statement or your if statement doesn't assign a value, the compiler is going to say, okay, we're just going to assign whatever the, pre, the, the most recently assigned value was, which might be nonsense. This creates bugs that are really hard to find. So just if you're writing out a case statement or if you're writing out an if statement, include a default case, first of all, or, or be extremely careful that you have, you have represented every possible outcome in your set of cases or in your set of if statements. So let me, let, I'm going to give you an example of this. Um, so let's, recalling inferred latches. So let's uh, consider the following code snippet. So um, consider the following code snippet. So we're going to have an always at Always at star is for uh, combinatorial logic. So always at star means if any of the inputs to this always statement change, instantaneously change all the other, all, all the, um, um, infer, it infers an element that changes value as soon as one of the inputs changes. So it's combinatorial, it's not tied to a clock. So always at star, begin and we'll set up a case statement on some uh, variable cell in the case that we'll assume that this is a two bit value. If it's one, one, we'll assign some variable D the value A. If it's one, zero, we'll assign D the value B. If it's uh, zero, zero, we'll assign D the value C end case. End. Uh, so what's the obvious problem with this? The, oops. Uh, the obvious problem is we forgot a case, right? So in the inevitable situation that cell assumes the value of zero one, which we have not incorporated into this uh, case statement, a latch will be inferred and the compiler will give the variable D whatever it's, how does this work? Whatever it's most recent assigned value was, um, which could be nonsense. It's building a clockless flip-flop, which is going to screw up your timing and perhaps worst of all. So let me just write this out. So this infers a latch. This will not throw an error because maybe you're a lunatic and this is how you actually wanted to do it. Um, that's almost, I, I can't imagine why you would want to do that, but, but maybe that's what you wanted to do. The compiler doesn't know. So what the compiler do is it doesn't throw an error, but it will create a warning. So if you're having some hard to track down bug associated with timing, search your warnings, there will be hundreds of warnings. Most of them are useless. 
Um, but search warnings for the keyword uh, inferred. If you find the keyword inferred in your list of warnings, there's a good chance that you forgot uh, a case in, in, in one of these, um, a case statement or an if else statement. Um, and I'll add, and always include a default. And then you don't have to worry about it. So in the case that, you know, in this case, we're switching on a two bit variable. Um, it's not so difficult to make certain that we've we've represented every possible value of that variable in a single case statement. If this were a 10 bit variable, that would be a lot more difficult, right? And would require a lot more Verilog. So in that case, the default makes a lot more sense. Um, any questions about this? Okay. So the next concept I want to remind folks about is blocking versus non-blocking assigns. Uh, so I'm going to start by just reminding folks of what sort of the rule is, and then I'll motivate why that rule is the rule. So the rule is um, if you are building combinatorial, which is to say unclocked logic, um, use a blocking assign. And I'll remind you that a blocking assign looks like the following. Um, it would look something like assign some signal the variable, the, the value X. Okay, the, um, the single equal sign here means blocking. Alternatively, if you are building sequential logic, clocked logic, use a non-blocking assign, which uses a different syntax. And that syntax would look like this. Um, where we use the, the uh, less than equals means non-blocking assign. So this is, this is the rule, right? So, and it's a very, very dangerous idea to mix these. Um, it's a very dangerous idea to have both blocking and non-blocking assigns in the same module or in the same set of logic. Um, if you're building clock logic, use a non-blocking assign. If you're building combinatorial logic, use a blocking assign. So why is this the case? Why? So um, let's consider, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to consider, have us consider two code snippets that are identical, except that one uses a non-blocking assign and the other uses a blocking assign. So consider the following code snippet. So um, we're going to build, we're attempting to build clock logic this time. So I'm going to say always at, and in this case, I'm going to add the conditional, always at the pause edge of some clock. We want the following things to happen. Um, the register Q1, we want to assume the value of some input that we're going to clock in some other register Q2 is going to assume the value of Q1 and some other register out is going to assume the value of Q2. So what we're attempting to do is build something like a, a shift register. Um, so the actual hardware that we're building here looks like this, right? So we have some clock and at the rising edge of the clock, at the positive edge of the clock, Q1, assumes the value of in, Q2 assumes the value of Q1, and out assumes the value of Q2. Because we're using a non-blocking assign within this block, simultaneously, um, 
the right side of each of these expressions gets shifted into the left side of each of these expressions. So this is building clocked sequential logic, um, which in this case is what we want. What if we used the, um, the blocking assigns? So what if we accidentally uh, did all, wrote almost the same um, Verilog, except that, except that we used um, blocking assigns. So we said Q1 equals in, Q2 equals Q1, and out equals Q2. This is going to build a different circuit. Right, so what the compiler is going to do is look at this and it's going to say, okay, I'm going to build a circuit in which Q1 assumes the value of in and then Q2 assumes the value of Q1 and then out assumes the value of Q2. Um, it's not going to execute these sequentially. Everything gets executed simultaneously, but it's going to build a circuit that satisfies this logic. So that circuit is gonna look like this, where instead of building the shift register that we wanted to build, what instead happens is at the rising edge of the clock, Q1, Q2, and out all get the value of in, which is not what we wanted, right? In the case that we're building combinatorial logic, that is what we want. So um, for combinatorial logic, this is what we want. So consider, so consider this snippet. Uh, suppose that we, we wanted to do something combinatorial. So suppose, for example, um, we wanted to do something like the following. Oops, always at, um, I'll say A or B or C, so if any of the inputs um, to this change, we want to give the register called X the value that we get by anding together the inputs A and B, and we want to give the variable, the register Y, the value that we get by oring together X and some other input C. Right, something combinatorial. Um, the circuit that this builds is, is what we want, right? So in this case, the circuit that this build looks like, builds looks like this, um, where what's going to happen is the compiler will build a circuit that first ands together A and B, and then ors the output with C and puts that in some register Y, which in this case is exactly what we want. Right, so um, again, if you're doing combinatorial stuff, use a, a um, blocking assign, a single equals. If you're building sequential logic, think state machine, then use the non-blocking um, assign. And I will just note, um, if you assign a signal, in one always block, you cannot assign it anywhere else. This would be the equivalent of hooking up two voltage sources to a single wire, right, which isn't a good idea. So if you're assign is, assigning a signal in one place, you can't assign it anywhere else. Um, you will run into this bug. This is, this is one of those things that, um, the simulation environment for Verilog and the, the instantiation of it on the FPGA are identical in almost every way. You can run into some discrepancies associated with this. Um, the simulation will allow you to do things like build a generate statement that creates a whole bunch of hardware and allow each of those pieces of hardware to drive a register that has the same name. On the actual FPGA, it will throw an error. It will say, you are attempting to drive multiple um, 
signals from different places within this uh, within the Verilog, which is not allowed. Right, you're hooking up multiple voltage sources to the same wire. So, so just keep an eye on that. Um, and as we get into lab two, this becomes an issue, and I'll I'll revisit this. Any questions? I'll, I'll make this document available on Canvas as well. Uh, okay, the, the last topic that I wanted to just remind folks about is um, multiplexing in Verilog. Because there are, there are a number of different ways that you can do this. Um, I wanna show you all the ways just to remind you and then you should just do whichever one that in, in that particular circumstance where you're attempting to multiplex something makes the code the least error prone and the most, the, the easiest for you to read. Um, so let's just consider, right, yeah, let's just suppose that we want to build um, a two to one mux. So something, something that would, something that looks like this. Right, so just some mux that depending on the, the value of our input bit cell um, will either assign the output um, D0 in the case that the input bit is one or D1 in the case that the input bit is zero. <laughs> it's a little, I should have swapped those around. It should have been D0 for zero and D1 for one, but that's okay. Um, but this is all that we're trying to build, right? Some, some very simple multiplexer. There are, there are three ways to do this. So the first way that we might do this is with a, um, a conditional assign. So we might do something like assign out equals, we'll look at the value of the input bit cell. And in the case that it is zero, we will um, output D1. And in the case that it is one, we will output D0, something like this. Which for, for very simple multiplexers is, is pretty readable. Um, and I'll mention too that you can nest these. So you could have another conditional assign as one of the, uh, on one side of this colon. This starts to get a little bit, as things get more complex, this particular syntax for doing a multiplexer can start to get error prone and confusing to look at. Um, so as things start to get complex, you might build the same circuit using, um, using maybe an if statement. So we might, we might do the following, which will build the same exact circuit, but the Verilog looks different. Um, so we might say something like always, uh, we're gonna build some combinatorial block and we'll say if cell equals equals zero, we'll give the output zero else begin, we'll give the output D1. Um, by the way, these underscores, uh, the compiler does not see those. So this is just purely for your readability. So if we wanted to, if we were writing out like some 32 bit binary number, um, you can do things like separate every four bits by an underscore, which makes it a lot easier for you to look at and uh, it will evaluate the same thing. So you can use underscores to your heart's content when you are declaring um, values like this. Um, I'll just remind folks of this syntax too, because maybe it's been a while since you've seen this. Uh, this one means it's one bit wide. Uh, we then use an apostrophe. The B means we're gonna represent this number in binary. I have an underscore just for readability and then I put a zero here. I could have an H here instead of the B and then I could enter the number in hexadecimal. I could have a D there and then I could enter the number as a decimal value. Okay. 
just syntax stuff. Out equals. Um, and then the third way to build or a case statement. There's a third way um, to build exactly the same, the same hardware. Um, we might say something like always at star combinatorial begin and we'll say in the case that cell is zero, then out gets to zero. In the case that cell is one, then out gets to one. And case end. Okay. Any questions about this? This seems somewhat familiar. I, I hope I'm not like boring. I hope this is valuable. Uh, I, I had a question. Yeah. The, uh, it, I think that in, when you originally wrote it, the, 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 the uh, circuit, uh, one mapped to zero and zero mapped to one. Oh, did I switch them in? Yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. So this, to match the circuit, this would then get one, this would get zero. This would get one and this would get zero. Yeah, thank you. And then this one I believe is right. Uh, I have a quick question about like the first method. Sure. Um, if you're working with a select that's greater than uh, two bits or yeah, greater than one bit, do you just add the different uh, input connecting them with the colon? What it, you know, for instance, if you had D zero through D three, could you do, you know, D one, D zero, D colon D one, colon D two, or does this only work for a binary situation with one bit? I don't know. I haven't tried that. Is one bit only? One bit only. So you can to, to do multiple bits you have to have a nested set of one bit selections. Don't do that. <laughs> if it gets, I mean, this is really handy for two, but when you get above two, use an always block. Oh, so the select is kind of acting as like a true or false statement. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Um, and then in that case, I just have a couple more things to be careful about. Um, one is be careful if you want, you, you can have signed register values. So you can declare a register as signed. And then the value within that register, um, it will be a, a two's complement signed value, um, but you have to declare it as such. So be careful to declare signed registers as such. So for example, we might say something like um, reg signed some 32 bit uh, register, signed register called X. If you don't call it signed, it defaults to unsigned. Okay. Uh, and along the same lines, be careful when shifting signed registers. Um, the signed shift is different from the unsigned shift. So a signed shift, if you have a signed register value and you want to right shift it, say, or left shift it, that is three greater thans or three less thans. Oops. That means signed shift. Unsigned shift is the normal looking one. That'll make bugs that are hard to find. Okay, so just when you're shifting stuff, 
be very careful. Think, is this assigned? Is this unsigned? Okay, I should use two or I should use three. Because um, Verilog doesn't care. It'll, it'll do an unsigned shift on a signed value and give you something, but it's not going to be what you're after. What would be the symptom of that? Actually, it won't preserve the MSV. What? Oh, it won't, yes, that's true. Yeah, it won't preserve the most significant bit. So it'll be like the wrong sign. Yeah. Yeah. So keep an eye out, right? That you can shoot yourself in the foot with that. Um, anything else? Does anyone else have anyone else who, who uses Verilog somewhat frequently? Is there any other bug or keyword that you look for when you're debugging stuff, when you have some impossible to track down problem? Um, implicit is another good one. So uh, search your warnings for implicit. If you, oops, if you um, use a register name that you have not declared, the compiler will be okay with that, but it will create a, a one bit register, I believe. Um, so it will compile and it will build, but it will do bizarre things. Um, so search your warnings for the word implicit and that means you're using something that you haven't declared. Um, One thing I remember uh, struggling with is uh, when instantiating registers, making sure that they're like given the right size for whatever we want to use them for. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great point. Um, make your register, but how should I put this? Be careful about register sizes. Um, and along the same lines, it's a very good idea in these case statements, in these if statements, the careful programmer will always specify the width of the register that they're switching on. Um, if you don't, I think there's a default value. I think it defaults to 32 bits or something like this. Defaults to a 32 bit integer. Okay. So a good idea to just tell it. Um, be obsessive, right, about, you know, I want it this big, and every time I talk about it, I'm going to be talking about something this big. Um, in the past, I have, I have been able to track down bugs by searching for stuck at GND. Um, that's, it's just another warning, but um, in the event that you are, um, there is some register value that you're attempting to manipulate and you've built your logic incorrectly or, or perhaps you've used the wrong name for the register and it's just never changing value. If, you, if it is initialized at zero and it never changes, the compiler will tell you, hey, this one's stuck at ground, which means it's never changing. So, um, I have found that one useful also. One book that I remember from our, why is this working? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, it just it doesn't show it. But one book I remember that was really hard for me to find when I was using Verilog was just like, when you're, do, when you're checking for a specific value in a register to actually make sure that you're using equals equals instead of just like one equal sign. That's a good one. Like if you're using with Python, it's like if you're used to that, and you yeah. just forget at one specific point, it's really hard to track like where in your code it's missing. And you have to yeah. just like look over all of it. Again, too, because it's not an error, right? So th those are the worst ones. So these are just a few things as you get started with doing Verilog writing for lab one, a few things to keep in the back of your head. Um, when is this class over? Is it 1.30 or 1.50? I think it's 130. 
one thirty. Okay. In that case, I will I will save the um, model sim, the simulation environment demonstration for Monday, which is fine because that'll still be before anyone's in lab. Um, this took a little bit longer than I expected, but that's okay. Any other questions, comments, or concerns? What do you think of this method for presenting code? Is this okay? Yeah? Okay. All right. Sounds good. Then I will, um, I will see you all on Monday and I will post this document on the Canvas website so that you can take a look at it if you would like to. And if anyone else has any other um, strategies for tracking down bugs that they would like to share with the classmates and with me, uh, I would like to learn from you folks as well, then please do that. Okay. All right. Good to see everyone. I will see you all on Monday. Have a good weekend. Um, I have a quick question about what like program you use to uh, make your like circuit diagrams. Okay. Do you like, um, yeah. Keynote. <laughs> Keynote. Okay, cool. Yeah, nothing fancy. Just I have a question about the, um, when you were giving the example about sequential versus, um, you know, non-blocking statements. Uh -huh. um, I had a question about the um, code that you read for, wrote for the um, shift register. Up this one here? Yeah, yeah, that one, yeah. Okay. Um, so like, um, can I just say like, what, I, what I'm interpreting as far as like when I trace down the code and yeah, absolutely. Um, you can calibrate it. Um, so like, it's a, so it says like always add pause edge clock and then it assigns into Q1. Uh -huh. So that means like at that point in time, because it's sequential, only Q1 and int are con in are connected, right? As far are as you, the Are you looking signals. at this one here? Yeah, yeah, the top one. So all of these things will happen simultaneously. Oh, okay, this is the, okay. Yeah, so the, these are non-blocking assigns. So all of these things happen simultaneously. So as soon as this edge goes high, all of these right sides go shunk into the left side. Okay, so, I see. But, which is why it's building this sort of uh, shift register. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, it's not sequential in the sense that each line gets interpreted differently. It's just sequential in like the signals get passed through sequ sequentially. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Would the or so then that means the order wouldn't matter at all. Like you could have done out um, uh, ass assigned to Q two. Yeah. At the very okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Order only matters if you have blocking assignments. I see. So it would matter here. Well, sort of. Yeah. Okay. I also have a really quick question about all these blocks, but or combinational logic. I okay. just want to make sure that uh, in that case, we still have to make the the data types of the things on the left registers, right? Regs, even though they're technically not registers. Bruce, can I answer one? that one? Yeah. So in Verilog, there is this weird distinction between a wire and a reg. If you just make your, uh, and, and if, you, if you update it, if you, I can't, I can't move the mouse over the code. That's right, it's not on my screen. Uh, if you, if you, if you update, if you assign the signal in an always block, it must have type reg, even if you consider it a wire. If you use, if you use, uh, oh, what's it called? Uh, uh, system Verilog. And all you have to do to use system Verilog on our system is change the extension on the file. I can't remember what it is now. Instead of V, it's SV or something. Yeah, it's dot SV. And, and if you do that, then you don't have the distinction between register 
and wire anymore. You just call it logic. But if you stick in Verilog, then formally speaking, if it has, if it's in an always block, it must be a reg. Uh, just to follow that up, is System Verilog available this semester for us to compile it? So it's, it just works. Portis includes System Verilog. I'll warn you, I don't have any experience with System Verilog, so I won't be able to provide as much help, but maybe you don't need it, so. <laughs> In the case, so, that's fine. yeah, and, and I don't either, except what I've learned from the students <laughs> over the last few years, which is this, this distinction between wires and logic, and also that um, signals are more flexibly indexed in system Verilog, and you can pass arrays into modules, if that matters to you. And it may in lab two. But you're on your own, as far as I'm concerned, you're on your own uh, if you start using system Verilog because I just told you everything I know about it. <laughs> Thanks, Bruce. Um, I, ha I just had a logistical question. Um, I know I'm, we're, most of us, I think, still are not enrolled in the class formally with the registrar. Yes, yeah, thank you for reminding me of that. Um, I have sent all of your names, net IDs, and lab sections to the department. I think that's everything they need. Um, so you should all be enrolled very soon. Uh, Keep an eye out, and if you're not in like the next two business days, let me know. But um, it should all be taken care of at this point. And I saw that some of you were able to enroll, so that's great. But um, yeah, all of you should be enrolled in the next few business days. Um, I just have a quick question going back to inferred latches. Okay. Um, so I feel like earlier you were talking about how the, when we write bear log for FPGA, we have to assume that there's essentially every, all the hardware that we're using is we have to build it. Like there's no memory that's already there or anything like that. So when you have an inferred latch, um, does, do we end up uh, essentially creating a deep flip flop then that's put on the FPGA? I believe so. Bruce, what do you have to say? It is not a D flip-flop because it's not clocked. It is a set reset uh, flip-flop. It is oh, asynchronously okay. set, which makes it impossible to do the timing analysis. Impossible in principle. And it also means that your design, unless you are extremely lucky, won't meet timing and will fail randomly. It'll work sometimes and not work sometimes. And it is beastly to debug. Don't do it. Okay. You, you know, you, this, this, this is the kind of thing that makes people cry in Verilog. <laughs> Anything else? Okay. Um, if anything else comes to mind and you want to talk about it before Monday, just reach out and happy to discuss. But uh, if not, then I'll see you all after the weekend. Thank you. Yep. See ya. Thank you.